Welcome to the Footprint Sustainability Index 2023 in association with Nestle Professional, with how, without whom this important research wouldn't be possible. I'm Amy Fetzer, Head of Research and Analysis at Footprint Intelligence, and I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes sharing the key findings from our hot off the press report, um, which draws upon wisdom shared by industry leaders and consumer service conducted by Viper, as well as wider industry analysis to focus on the salient need to know insights for 23-24, so you don't have to. And what all this amazing body of research has shown that sustainability is transforming the hospitality and food service landscape really dramatically. Um, so for example, one of our consumer surveys found that 42% of people in the UK would now say they would choose a lasagna with a 50% lower carbon footprint over a traditional lasagna. Um, so I'm going to be discussing these key trends in strategy, culture, waste, energy and efficiency um, and natural resources and staffing with our expert panel. And they are a brilliant panel. Um, I think they're going to pop up on the screen now. We've got Julia Jones, who's head of B2B marketing and sustainability lead for Nestle Professional. Uh, we've got Philip Rowden, who is the global food and sustainability wellbeing manager at ISS. And Rachel Eyre, the Sustainability Procurement Manager for Food by UK and Ireland. So it's a bit of a different format today. I'm going to share some insights from the report. Then we're going to talk about them with the panel. They're going to share some insights, some of which will be included in the report, some of which will be uh, new and exciting as well. And we're going to kind of have it really interactive as we go along. And of course, you, the audience, can send in your questions via YouTube and they'll be passed to me by my colleagues so I can address them to the panel as we go, or if there's any for me, of course, too. Now, this year, more than ever, it's been really striking to see how the industry has progressed since our last report in 2022. And that's been largely driven by the passion and the urgency of its people. But despite these amazing efforts, and that's so many of you out there listening, um, the hospitality and food service sector still has so far to go before it's firmly on target to achieve those um, net zero targets to reverse biodiversity loss and to transform to a more socially just world. So as usual, I've massively struggled to distill all this year of frantic activity into um, to something, you know, to tell you about it in 45 minutes, but you know, we're gonna go through some of the key nuggets. There's tons more in the report that you can all look at uh, at your leisure later. That's out at two o'clock today. That's, um, and then they'll be available from the website after that. So first of all, I'm gonna share some of the key findings with you. And the first chapter is around strengthening strategy, culture, and the supply chain. And what's really interesting is Ketcher Simmons, who's the managing director of Nestle Professional, summed up kind of how the industry is now viewing um, sustainability within strategy and saying, one of the biggest sustainability challenges for hospitality and food service is reducing scope-free emissions. There's been this massive widespread recognition of the urgency of tackling the ingredients on the plate. People, um, really are working on that very hard. And as you saw from our consumers poll, about 42% choosing the lasagna with the reduced carbon footprint, consumers really get this too. Um, so I'm going to dig into a couple of the key insights, one of which is that the cost of living, sorry, cost of living crisis is risking progress. There was, um, despite the greater understanding of the need and the commitment actually across industry for um, like, you know, for commitment towards the progress on net zero, the Global Economic Forum's Global Risk Report found that much needed resources are being diverted away from rapidly accelerating risks to ecosystems to tackle the cost of living crisis. So, and this is really interesting because, you know, actually at the coal face of industry with all the interviews that we did, that's what people kept on saying that they said that 2022 was the toughest year yet as cost pressures bit and government support was withdrawn. Um, however, on the plus side, of course, that the, the things like energy prices meant that things like uh, acting on food waste, installing energy efficient kit or management software became uh, much more appealing. So things did did change, but just not far and fast enough. So this this is a really urgent reminder that the time for dallying is absolutely over. The IPCC says global emissions need to be reduced by 43% by 2030. That's in seven short years. And as Bob Gordon from the Zero Carbon Forum said, 
The time for digging is over. We must take meaningful action now. Um, so another key insight is that accelerated action is happening on scope three. So there's a really good news here. There's a groundswell of change. It's not yet enough, but it's happening. And in, within this, 30% of HAFs, uh, that's hospitality and food service businesses, have signed up to Zero Carbon Forum. Um, according to the CDP, about 70% of businesses are now reporting scope one and two, um, but only 41% us reporting scope three. Now, there's been a lot of movement in this space, and that's been supported by tools and protocols like Zero Carbon Forum, RAPS, uh, Scope 3 Protocol, the Global Farm Metric. There's been lots of movement. And then, of course, there's been a huge rise in uptake in people using carbon footprinting um, ingredient tools like food print, um, you know, all these other ones. But the the uh, authenticate food steps, cool food, there's tons of them out there. It's making the footprinting of memories mainstream. So there's a real sense that although the reporting isn't there yet, a lot of actions happening behind the scenes to get this data. So the key message to anybody listening is you aren't sorting your scope three and able to report on it. You are behind and you need to because it's, it's coming. Um, Alongside this, the next key insight I wanted to share is that the industry is thirsty for detailed quality data. Um, so the insiders we spoke to really felt that there was going to be this continued evolution from educated guesses to evidence based strategies. So over the coming years, we're going to really see um, footprints related to company specific supply chains, you know, that particular farm, that particular milk. Um, and that's going to really help drive the switch to sustainable farming practices as suppliers get recognized for the efforts that they're putting in. Um, one of the most troubling um, but sort of uh, important uh, insights is that biodiversity loss is being widely recognized now as as big a threat as climate breakdown. The World Economics Forum Global Risks Report said that nature loss and climate change are intrinsically linked. A failure in one sphere will cascade into another and attaining net zero will require mit mitigatory measures for both. Um, they cited the example of how restoring biodiversity in soils, perhaps through regenerative agriculture, has the potential to store carbon. So they are massively linked. And again, we're going to talk about this with our panel shortly, but the you know, agriculture and animal farming take up 35% of the world's surface and they are also the biggest drivers of global wildlife decline. And, you know, it's surprisingly high input, high output farming systems tend to have the biggest uh, negative impacts. And as well, they often struggle, can struggle to uh, be a profitable. But there's a load of evidence now that's showing you can farm, you can produce in a way that is um, good for nature and good for the planet and good for the profit. Uh, good for profit. And it's great to see so many businesses who are switching towards um, doing this. And also, we've got great global movements, um, like the company countries agreed to protect a third of the planet for nature by 2030 in a landmark deal at COP15. And obviously, we've got the task force for nature related disclosures coming through soon. And there's things like the RSPP, Fair to Nature Standard, um, being more widely adopted as well. So there's a lot back on. But if we could bring our panel back on, I wanted to start talking to them about what they're seeing on the ground. Um, hello, lovely panel. Um, you are so Thankful for, to you for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to all your insights. Um, so, Nestle, Julia, could you tell us, uh, last year you won Footprint Sustainable Na Use of Natural Resources Award for the amazing work you've been doing with your British dairy farmers. And I know that this has um, led to some really deep, detailed work on tangibly reducing farm impacts that you're looking to get to the stage where you can actually field by field uh, analysis to look at what's being sequestered, you know, can you talk me a bit about how you're doing this um, and, and really kind of, you know, what kind of impacts we can have? Yes, um, of course. Um, and yeah, f firstly, thank you. Um, thank you for the invite to be here today. Delighted to be part of our um, report launch with you. Um, so yes, um, there's, a, there's a lot in your question, so I'll try to keep as, um, as succinct as I, as I can. Uh, so yes, essentially, our work with the British dairy farmers um, to implement regenerative agriculture is a vital part of our net zero roadmap. Um, and you've talked about scope three um, and our net zero roadmap, 95% in scope three. Um, so yes, we won the, um, the sustainable use of natural resources Resources um, Award last year, which we were um, really delighted to win. Um, it was work that was um, 
um, that we were doing over over eight years, so um, back since 2015, uh, with um, Dairy Cooperative First Milk, um, which is um, 80 farmers across Ayrshire and Cumbria. Um, so essentially, we buy about 1% of the UK uh, milk supply, um, which is millions of um, litres of fresh milk every year. Uh, and that goes into our Nescafe Throthy products, Throthy coffee products and, um, the, and confectionery. And what was um, and has, has always been really important is the partnership element to this. So it was very much um, co-created from the beginning. So what we did initially was work with the Wildlife and Conservation Trust, um, essentially to decide the right approach um, in implementing sustainability practices. Um, and then um, we discussed with the farmers to make sure that it would benefit them um, sort of back then and in the long term. Um, so we were always really careful to make it as easy as possible for the farmers. Um, so, so photo evidence um, is what we were asking, sort of pre, during, post on, uh, on the sustainability practices that they were doing. Um, and so practically what it um, meant was that we were asking them to increase the biodiversity um, through trees and hedge planting, rebuilding um, stone walls. Um, and then as the partnership evolved further, um, it was more coming into the center of the farm. So mob grazing and moving the cows from field to field, adding cover crops, um, focusing on feed from forage. Um, so for all of these things, we then um, have um, always given the farmers a sustainability bonus so that they can very much then continue to regenerate the land um, and for them ensure um, also that fair income for their milk. Um, and it's the long term approach, which is um, really important because, um, as you, um, I think, touched on, you don't get an immediate benefit from regenerative agriculture. Initially, you could see that yields, start, yields can go down a bit, but then after a couple of years, um, and sometimes it can take longer, um, then with the nature friendly practices, um, so it's not an exact science, but you can then start to see the yields increasing. Um, so it kind of takes a bit of patience, but it um, it will result in a in a win win. And then um, where um, so the bit you, um, that you were talking about the field by field soil carbon analysis um, and where we um, we believe we're being truly pioneering here is work that we're now doing um, with First Milk and AgriCarbon. So essentially, um, we first of all wanted to establish a baseline. Uh, so in each of these um, 80 farms, um, we took a soil sample in each field along with a GPS location. Um, and then the same will be done in five years time. So um, essentially, um, and also taking uh, samples during that period as well. So essentially it's using state of the art machinery, but in simple terms, it's a really big tube um, <laughs> that goes into the soil one meter deep um, in kind of three sections to measure that carbon. Um, so essentially That's it's a scientific really approach using experts um, hand in hand with farmers and we'll um, have the results in, in five years time. And this is really brilliant to see this kind of combined uh, approach because it's showing that you can really make those tangible differences to the emissions related to the food we eat. And as I said, that looks like it's going to start feeding through into people's supply chains, being able to see those farms who are investing in those suppliers. So thank you very much. Uh, alongside this, one of the other insights that came through from a strategy and culture perspective was about the leadership being shown by efforts to transform climate finance. So uh, some of this has been inspired by things like the Bridgetown Initiative, which has been led by Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley, which sets out to address fundamental flaws in development finance. But uh, when I spoke to Compass, so Rachel, when I spoke to your sustainability lead, Carolyn Ball, she was so passionate about the role of hospitality and food service to sort of drive this transformational change of food system finance. So we've got, you know, Julia talking about the stuff on the ground, you know, can you tell me a bit about you know your efforts at Compass and Food Buy to drive this transformational transformational change of food system finance? Yeah, absolutely. Like you say, it's it's a new area for us, but something we're incredibly excited about. Um, I think it was last year that Compass Group, our, our parent company, they issued two sustainable bonds for the first time, which raised a total of seven hundred and fifty million euros. Essentially, uh, the, the proceeds are used in line with our sustainable financing framework and the money is allocated to encourage responsible sourcing of, of various types. So it could be purchasing from local and diverse suppliers or projects that support value chain decarbonisation. And I think what is especially valuable uh, for of this sustainable bonds is that it can drive progress in markets that are less advanced when it comes to sustainability. So you can imagine we're, we're operating in some 40 something countries and maybe they don't all have the same level of client interest or regulatory landscape as the UK and the US, for example. But the, the money that's coming in still allows us to drive change there. 
That's so important and really, really uh, exciting. Um, I've got to whiz on now to the delivering sustainable diet section. So it was very, very fascinating for us to discover when we did our Ask Our Consumer panel this year, if they tried to reduce the amount of meat they ate, 52% said that they had. That's a slight dip from last year, which was 64%. But it's really interesting to see that people are still focused on on using their diet to to tackle uh, planetary impacts. Um, And actually, when I spoke to Isaac Pelham Chipper, the procurement and supply chain director um, for ESG at the restaurant group, he said that encouraging our customers to eat less meat is one of the biggest ways we can reduce our carbon footprint. Veganism is massive for us. And this sort of was reflected across the research that we did. You know, so if you're not decarbonizing your menus, you're behind which, um, as we've touched upon, are dominated by ingredients. They can be up to between 60 and 90 percent of hospitality and brewing businesses overall emissions, according to Zero Carbon Forum. So, you know, they're really, um, really dramatic. Uh, Philip, uh, when I spoke to you for the research, you were telling me all sorts of fascinating and exciting things about ISS's approach to decarbonizing through your menus. So um, can you just talk a little bit about how you're doing this, how you're looking at your ingredients and and minimizing impact that way? Yeah, no, thank you for inviting me. Um, Yeah, I suppose we've been working really hard on this area um, and we wanted a way to measure ingredients across our operation globally so that we can drive change in all of our locations. Um, So one of the ways we've done that is we've uh, signed up something called the Cool Food Pledge um, through the World Resource Institute. And working through our uh, procurement teams, we've analysed all of the food that we're purchasing on a global scale. And that's really given us really valuable insight um, by understanding exactly where we're buying and how much we're buying. Um, And that's allowed us to then work with Cool Food in sort of setting targets. So we've committed to a 25% reduction in our GHGs by 2030 from the food we buy. Um, and because cool food methodology uses a broader range of metrics, um, it gives us a really good way of understanding what's happening, but it also gives us that credible way of reducing our CO2. And that was what was really important to us, because we also wanted to be able to stand behind what we're saying. Um, and that's what this has allowed us to do. And it's really powerful um, by joining some, a program like Cool Food that we're able to be part of a global commitment that's focusing on reducing greenhouse gases across 3.5 billion meals annually. So we know that that will deliver real scale and impact. And that's what we need to be doing. And, and so I know that you shared with us that the, the you discovered through this process that rumen and meat was 4% of your menu by weight, but 43% of your CO2. So yeah. you know, how did that drive change within the business? You know, was it the customers that were you know responding or was it, you know, the business? I, it, I suppose it's this evidence-based data um, that it makes it easier for us to express the need for change because um, we're able to share that with all stakeholders across the business and then that's mm-hmm. what makes it clear to us what we need to change because we know if we can shift that from four percent to three and a half to three percent we can have an absolutely very significant impact um, across um, across our global operations. And I think um, I remember you touching on how helpful it was in terms from a management, senior management perspective, it really enabled them to see that this was a key way to meet those net zero targets. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, and Rachel, I know uh, Compass, you know, how are you, I know you're doing lots of work. You last week won um, an award with your, for your work with Eurest and carbon footprinting of menus there. You know, how are you finding that this data is transforming conversations about re-engineering menus to reduce climate impacts yeah i'd say just to build on philip's point it's all about having an evidence-based approach so without that data there are reasonable assumptions that we can make about what a climate friendly menu looks like but having the data to evidence it is transformational um we were finding many enthusiastic chefs buyers and operators that were keen to make changes but didn't have the right tools to do so um and also to communicate the benefits of those changes so um although as you reference your rest um working with the leap project um and some of our other sectors have have various projects of their own Centrally, we've now established a partnership with Food Steps to analyse the climate data behind our recipes. That's all 90,000 of them um, and allow for science based reformulation. So 
I think where that adds benefit is is being able to evidence how specific ingredient swaps can translate into an actual measurable reduction it means that we can start to approach sustainable menu design with as much rigor as we're used to practicing commercial menu design. And I think what came through as well, talking to Carolyn, talking to some others within the industry is how being able to play around with the ingredients of a particular menu to just reduce that portion of, of, of beef in the burger or mince in the bolognese um, or, you know, swap out a milk product or a cream product in a, in a soup, that that could have a dramatic impact and how that was, as you say, really enabling for chefs so that the this kind of increased availability and uptake of the footprinting is driving quite uh, substantial changes really it's very exciting do more of it everybody it's great um, so um so leading to the the next insight uh is that we it was very clear uh from our engagement was that food system change is also needed alongside this to meet climate targets we really really need transformational radical change uh bob gordon and uh is it was, was quoted in the report as saying this you know we're hitting the biological limits of how much we can reduce carbon within our current food system, so we need to change the systems. So while we need to change the menus, they aren't going to change diets fast enough on their own. So we do need the long-term shifts proposed by Henry Dimbleby's National Food Strategy. And that means national uh, transformable changes in food production. So perhaps things like precision fermentation, uh, cultured meat, growing fruits and vegetables to vertical farming, feed, um, feeding livestock on insects, fed on food waste. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff uh, that needs to happen. Um, what was always really also really interesting in the sustainable diet space was this insight that came through of that familiar favorites and rebalancing hold power. So when we asked people, do you choose uh, plant-based versions of familiar favorites such as veggie burgers, nuggets, veggie burgers, veggie versions of classics like lasagnas or cottage pie when you're eating out, over half, 54% of people said yes. So people are really shifting towards this and that's what the industry is uh, focusing on quite heavily and noticing that these sort of new spins, plant-based or plant-focused uh, versions of old favourites tend to be the most successful. And that, of course, has been supported and driven by some really high-profile uh, plant-based launches such as McDonald's and, and Burger King. So it's really, um, really changing the landscape. Um, but Julia, you know, why are these reformulated versions of classics so important from a consumer perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the it's, it's all part of, as you talked about there, encouraging people to consume less meat and where meat eaters are used to having the option to select from that full menu and choosing familiar favourites, why shouldn't someone who could consider a plant-based option have that, that same? So, um, so we need to give them the equally similar delicious eating experience. And essentially, you know, we've got vegans who you know they're totally converted we need the mass market to be consuming less meat to meet the climate um, targets so essentially the the familiar favorites can help bring along the larger group to make those dietary changes that we need them to make so them feeling comfortable to make that switch and to try um and um yeah so essentially those um reformulating those classics is an absolutely critical part of encouraging the consumer to eat less meat. And we're very much um, hearing from customers, particularly in um, in the QSRs, that actually it's those core lines where it's really critical to have the plant-based version. With restaurants and pubs, it's a bit different. They can offer a more variety um, and more experimenting, but but the, the core lines are absolutely critical to, to bring the sort of the larger group of people along um, on the journey. At the same time, it's, um, important to encourage people to eat more vegetables and legumes um, to increase that fiber and micronutrients. So um, so at the same time, we'll be working hand in hand with our partners on menu creation um, with, with that familiar favorite, but combined in a dish with an increased amount of vegetables and legumes. Um, so, Perfect. So, and that's yeah. actually one of the other insights in the report that I wasn't going to touch on here, but the healthier um, options need to be healthier by default. We need to help people be healthier. Um, Philip, I just wanted to bring you in here because when we were, uh, it's in the report as well, but when we were talking for the research, you talked about how ISS had tweaked some recipes across its school's business to reduce impact. So could you share some of the sort of top line results of that work? Yeah, I can do. And I suppose it was all about our sort of effort to sort of make the 
these options, the easy, the easy choice and the healthier and tastier. Um, so we've done some work within our education business and we tweaked hundreds of recipes, but we've had a really significant impact. Um, we've been able to actually reduce the, the CO2 of an average meal by over 400 grams. Um, we've actually also managed to make them healthier. So there's, you know, 8% less saturated fat, um, 12%, um, uh, 60% increase in fiber, um, increase in the five a day. Um, so it's, it's enabled us to have, you know, 15,000 pupils every term eating healthier meals um, or per week, sorry. Um, and that's going to um, reduce our carbon footprint by nearly 80,000 kilograms per term. So you can see the impact, but also the kids love them as well. So these tweaks and changing of the favorites can have a big impact um, without having to change wholesale dishes. That's absolutely brilliant. And I know that I think that that average sort of 420 grams per meal, that equates to driving a petrol car for about a mile, doesn't it? So it's quite substantial just per meal. Yes, you can have a Um, really large impact. Brilliant. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's so exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, now, alongside this, this greater uptake, we have also seen uh, plant-based is under scrutiny over health, and there has been some well-publicized slowdowns and products were withdrawn in this space. Um, and some of this has been just driven by concerns over health and sourcing, because obviously some plant-based products can be uh, quite heavily processed, um, and, and some of the product lines might not have clear sourcing information. So I know, Julia, that a company uh, like Nestle has invested very heavily in making sure that your plant-based ranges uh, you know, are still uh, as nutritious as they can be and you have very clear sourcing and a very transparent sourcing um, information. But you know, how, how do you help, you know, how do you navigate this plant-based space and how can operators know how to identify these sort of better plant-based products that are healthier and which have a lighter impact on the planet? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it really comes down to that um, that that transparency. Um, so, I mean, we'll um, certainly in developing the, the products, um, we're you know using the expertise of our nutritionists to um, to develop the products with with care for our operators. Um, so, as yeah, Garden Gourmet, um, which is our plant based um, plant based uh, brand, um, so we'll be working hard and continuously innovating. So, you know, at the moment it's um, got no red nutritional traffic lights. Um, it's rich in protein and the source of fiber. Um, non HFSS meets the 2024 20, salt reduction targets. But it's not like we stop there. We're continuously striving to make sure um, that we're improving those nutritional um, nutritional values. Um, but also, as we talked about before, keep, keeping that same taste. So it's that transparency which is really important. Um, and then equally on the the planet side, um, again, it's that that sourcing which is really important so um, moving towards regenerative agriculture again um, and we're also transitioning towards European soy with our um, garden gourmet product um, exploring um, you know packaging so we are in um, the design for recycling packaging um, but we know that the infrastructure isn't necessarily there to recycle it so we're still exploring alternative packaging for that from sort of multi to mono um, etc so but yeah it's very- transparency. And in this space as well, Julia, I touched on it earlier, one of the other sort of insights that came through is that cultured meat is showing promise and it's a way off yet because of the regulatory red tape and the tech still being developed. Um, but apparently there's research that indicates it can reduce land use by sort of 95% uh, compared to beef and there's been delegations going with Zero Carbon Forum to, to Ivory Farm Technologies, for example, to see what's happening there. In fact, Footprint's taking a delegation soon. but. Um, Can you tell us about, Julia, the work that you're doing in this space? Are we going to see cultured meat on menus anytime soon? Oh, now Julia's paused for me. Has she paused for everybody else? Oh, there you are. Now say it. Try again, Julia. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Um, Yes, absolutely. We're um, we're exploring, always exploring the new technologies and emerging trends, and um, and yeah, cultured meat's very much part of that. Now, are we going to see it on our plates in the UK soon? Uh, from from an SLA point of view, I'm not sure we um, we are right right yet, but absolutely, we're researching the possible options. Um, so we um, have been working on the cultured meat with external um, partners and startups, um, and that all happens in our research institute in um, in Lausanne. 
Uh, so we've been working with um, with One Future Meat Technologies, and as you say, it can absolutely reduce that need for um, the land um, and the resources to raise animals. Uh, so, so yeah, I think it's it's an interesting interesting area. Um, it's very much you know there are many options as part of a um, a future enabling people to consume less meat. So whether it's plant based, whether it's um, meat from a regenerative farm, whether it's cultured meat, you know the future is going to be a combination of these options. Perfect. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to addressing food and packaging waste. And interestingly, consumers still care about both of these issues. Over a quarter told us that they chose a place to eat because it was tackling food or plastic waste. Uh, starting with food waste, we know uh, Nestle Research found that 73% of customers want sustainable food. And the top area of concern is food waste. And um, there was a great quote from Abby Shaw in the report so talk, which, where she says, tackling food waste means understanding where you're bleeding money. You identify what products you can reduce wastage on and what saving, and that saving goes straight to the bottom line while supporting your net zero goals. So she really kind of explains the, the brilliant win-win of tackling food waste. And it's so exciting because IKEA has shown that it's completely possible. They smashed their 50% target seven years early to achieve a 54% reduction in food waste. Um, uh, now already, and that's like absolutely translated into you know more than twenty million meals, saving thirty seven thousand dollars and thirty six thousand tons of CO two equivalent. So it's really exciting and shows it is possible. Um, so uh, Rachel, can you tell me um, you know why do you think tackling food waste has come to the fore? Yeah, absolutely. I think. I mean, first of all, most of us working in the industry are, are very familiar with the, the horrifying statistics around food waste. So it's great to see uh, that the report highlights consumers are still switched on to that and happy to base their decisions on where they eat on that. Um, for us, I can probably point to three reasons why food waste has become one of our biggest priorities. So firstly, uh, since pandemic as a result of the cost of living increases that we're all experiencing, I think everyone is far more aware of of what they're buying, how they're using it, and ultimately making the most of products. So this is leading to less food waste at both home and, and in business. Um, our parent company, Compass Group, actually um, created a, a food waste recipe cookbook um, as part of our global Stop Food Waste Day. It's, it's free to access, so I recommend checking it out. If you have a little Google, you'll probably find it online. Um, secondly, already touched upon we can't ignore the commercial effect rap estimates that food waste costs at the hospitality and food service sector 3.2 billion pound per year so having visibility around food waste really matters to battle the increasing pressures on margins and also i'd say that although we are still waiting on the outcome of the consultation on business reporting on food waste which closed in autumn last year we are getting ahead of the game to embed recording food waste into normal operations so, yeah, I mean, actually, that touches on the next insight, which is that mandatory reporting is on its way. So, as you said, the consultation closed in late 2020. Um, and according to, but interestingly, according to RAP, 32% of food and drink, large food and drink businesses do measure and report, um, but they aren't you know, reporting publicly, I think they're doing it internally. And lots of them do seem to be on track to meet the 50% by 2030 reduction. So that's really exciting. Um, you were talking a bit about your program. Do you have any stats to share, Rachel, about how your um, Waste Not digital tracking systems helped you um, reduce waste? So I know that the Waste Not um, has been rolled out globally um, and in the UK, we're um, focusing on a slightly different in-house system um, based on the, the system we use to create our recipes. So that's actually been mandated for all systems now, sorry, all units to support the accurate measurement and reduction of food waste. Um, and one of the issues that we identified is that food waste is often lumped together, which makes it difficult to understand where and, and why the waste occurs. So. We've been working hard to evolve the tech so we can help both our people and our clients to understand at which stages of food service produce the, mo the most waste um, and mm. to create those specific and targeted interventions. Um, so whether that's um, food waste created because it's out of day, it's plate, it's post-production, pre-production or, or even retail waste, um, we're planning to develop that capability further to bring in emissions to it as well later down the line. 
Fantastic. Thank you. And I know that the, your programs managed to reduce food waste by 28% across the 28 countries. So it's, it's really working. Um, so uh, another few things that came through when talking about food waste is that strategies must be, perf uh, must be public. So obviously, we talked about the RAP funds at a third of recording, but it's not trickling down to the reporting. Uh, technology drives action. As you alluded to, Rachel, people need that granular data. And I think, Philip, you know, you've been finding this as well, that these systems such as Winnow and LeanPath and the others that are out there really have the granularity to enable those hotspots to be identified and addressed. We also came through really strongly that alleviating food poverty motivates steps as motivate staff, sorry. So people from Olio to CH and Co noted that when surplus was unavoidable, that redistribution was a really powerful engagement tool for team members. Um, and also something that came across was that in certain circumstances, it doesn't suit everything, but um, people like Chantal Nicholson from Opricity shared how set menus can massively reduce waste by reducing the stock being held and enabling more accurate ordering and prepping. Um, portion sizes are also an easy win. RAP research found that 48% of consumers waste food because of large portions. And the research also found that three in five people are concerned about wasting food and therefore wasting money when they dine out. So it's uh, really key. Uh, moving on to packaging in the waste category. So uh, again, 22%, so just over a fifth, chose a place to eat because it uses sustainable packaging. And what's really fascinating about this is that figure shot up to 46% for hospitality workers. So they really care about um, eco-packaging or packaging that can be recycled. And, and, and also across the general population, 36% of 18 to 24-year-olds said they chose a place to eat because of sustainable packaging. So it does matter. Um, I don't want to, in some ways, get into packaging too much because there's loads in there in the report, but also evolving so much. Uh, it has made a lot of progress, but it's still a thorny issue. Obviously, we've still got delays to DRS and there's you know obviously that wider acknowledgement that packaging is fills an important um, function uh, so itself isn't the problem but single use is um, and the sort of another thing that came through in the research was the fact that there is it's hard to find an LCA to help you identify what type of packaging material should be used in a certain scenario and you know which would be the lighter footprint um, between you know compostables and plastics and glass and reusables and you know, all these different things. Um, so it's quite hard. However, um, one thing that did get, get come through is that for hospitality and food service, tackling plates, containers and cups is a priority because with DRS on its way, eventually, um, RAPS figures indicate that 2 to 4% of cups and containers, only 2 to 4% are recycled. So that's a massive priority. Um, and we talked a bit about earlier about why alternatives really need to be chosen carefully to make sure they suit um, the waste system that 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 site has and that that operation is within um, and also that you really understand what that product is and what that you know that label means there's a lot of products that are labeled plastic free but actually still have plastics and there's people like um, I was talking to the founder of the Notpla who won the Earthshot Prize and they were explaining he was explaining to me how um, that all these microplastics go into the ocean and plankton eat the microplastics and then their poo, which is a massively important carbon sequestration mechanism, because you know, sequesters billions of tons of carbon every year, um, 12, 12 billion actually every year. These microplastics make the poo the poo float. So finding products such as seaweed-based liners that actually are still biodegradable means that you don't create additional problems with product pro products yeah. that are marketed as plastic free but still have microplastics. Um, alongside this, the reusables uh, are also present significant opportunities, and we're doing a fuller report on that topic alone later in uh, the year. But you know, it's really exciting with McDonald's trialing reusables, and you know, a lot of different environments where they really um, work well. And wear washers like Micah coming into the space by really developing the right uh, kit to make sure <clears throat> the reusables can be washed efficiently and and cost effectively. Um, Nestle, we've told a whole bunch of stuff, Julia, um, about packaging. You know, what are your, you know, if we could just have a quick cup insight from your speculative packaging facility and where, you know, what you think is a key kind of insight from a packaging perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's the partnership element. Um, to deliver on the packaging commitments. We can't do it alone. We need to work with experts in their field. Um, and that's what our um, institute is, is all about. So working with, um, with startups 
um, and yeah, in con kind of conjunction with our existing kind of food safety and food science knowledge, um, but essentially focusing on the science and technology areas. So um, to find the solutions to, um, like you talked about, refillable, reusable, simplified packaging materials, and the benefit that um, that we have through this um, sort of facility is that because we're sort of multi-category, the work that they're doing on say. Uh, quality street or smarties to move to paper packaging that can then transfer across to another product so garden gourmet which is in frozen yes it's going to be a different solution um but understanding that sort of paper barrier um and um with the um uh, yeah so the sort of learnings from one and transferring across to the other so essentially i think the key message is it's the importance of working together with experts um and research to find these these solutions um, on packaging Fantastic. Um, so moving on to attracting and retaining clients, that chapter. So we found that almost a quarter of consumers specifically chose a place to be because of its ethics, environmental practices in the last 12 months. Um, although interestingly, we noticed that they are increasingly wary of claims. So we had a reduction from 35% uh, up from 45 last year that would choose a venue based on it having sign of saying it's committed to net zero. Um, but we do know that, that well, alongside this, you know, regulators such as the Competition and Markets Authority are clamping, clamping down on unsubstantiated claims. Um, so it is becoming a more uh, complicated uh, space to talk about what you're doing with your consumers. But alongside this, you know, we know that it's still really important. Um, in fact, people like Sodexo told us that it, that they think their sustainability, their strong sustainability messaging and, and action, of course, importantly, is a key factor in its 97% client retention rate. Um, but so what, one of the things that has come about recently is this new term of green hushing. So according to research by South Pole, 67% of companies have set net zero targets, um, but 25% hadn't published them um, because they're wary of scrutiny or you know, not delivering. Um, and on the other hand, you know, operators are bombarded by sales calls and they don't know who to choose to, to partner with when they need help. So maybe, um, Philip, from an ISS perspective, could you kind of tell me, you know, you mentioned your Cool Food project and how you chose them. You know, how do you navigate with who to partner with and how to present this to the world? Um, that's a very good question. And I, I, it's taking that time to, to research and understand. And essentially, that's why we worked with Cool Food, because they're part of the World Resource Institute. And it, it, it was that credibility. And that was, that was the, the, the deciding factor for us was about have, being able to credibly describe and talk about what we're doing and not have that greenwashing claim. And that's that's what we're doing. I think as, as more of this regulation comes on board, companies will need to be able to substantiate and it's being able to show and demonstrate what you've done. Um, and that's the, the really important piece that you've got to be, to be wary of. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and also, we um, talked a bit already about how HAFS has a responsibility to support health. This is um, another one of the insights that came through because vegan and veggie orders have tripled according to Just Eat Research. But who um, has found that takeaways might contribute to Europe, Britain becoming Europe's fattest nation? Um, that same Just Eat Research found that chips were still the most popular side and pizza brands the most popular restaurant type. So, Nestle, you know, how can HAFS help customers be healthier, especially with these sort of cost of living dynamic, uh, cost of living issues changing dynamics? Um, so I think what is quite interesting is the different tools that are coming into play now and the chefs in hospitality and food service can have a massive role here. Um, so, yeah, so I think that the chefs designing the menu and using all of these new softwares um, to understand the nutrition and the carbon footprint. Um, and at the same time, by sort of building that menu with that lower carbon footprint at the same time, building the lower cost of the dish. Um, so, you know, that the sort of incorporating, like we talked about before, vegetables and legumes um, to maybe bring that, that slightly cheaper cost of dish um but yeah. designed with the nutritional and the footprint carbon footprint in mind so so i think yeah it's the power of the chef for me um and co-working with our partners to mm -hmm. kind of deliver that that change perfect um moving on to the saving energy and protecting natural resources chapter um what's really interesting is people are looking to future proof their businesses and the return on investment for energy equipment 
uh, efficient equipment is now massive. We, we've mentioned that before. Um, and actually, what was really interesting, this is a new question we asked this year, was would you stop using a restaurant pub or cafe if you thought it was wasting energy? And, and 28%, so over a quarter of people said they would. So people um, do care about this. It's coming up their priority list. Uh, what's really interesting is that one of the persistent issues in the past was that the specs for sustainable equipment would be put into a tender, but they'd be bypassed in favor of capital cost reduction. But insiders told us from people like Keith Warner, Warren, the former CEO of the Food Service Equipment Association, and Paul Anderson of uh, the Whale Washer Myco, noted that this has really now shifted. Now, the energy, the return on investment on the energy saving tech is, is really driving that uptake and also a switch towards, towards more kit um, and, and ways to identify where you're leading, leaching energy and addressing it. Um, Connectivity is also enabling better management with real-time energy use, helping organizations such as the big table identify hotspots and address them. Automation is also relieving pressure. So uh, things like lifting um, wear washer hoods, which can be quite uh, tiring and, and hard for staff. It's also um, you know, making the, the saving energy and saving it, making more efficient, but also making it a more pleasant work environment. And you've also got people like installing slices for lemons and things to reduce waste. So there's lots of, sort of little tiny macro things, um, mi micro things and macro things happen happening as well. Um, uh, a really important thing in this space is that the, the when we're looking at natural resources, that the majority are now taking action on water. And we, that seems to be driven a lot by the core told water roadmap 2030 that had its first anniversary in late 2020 and that was a year you know obviously last year was defined by record droughts wildfires and floodings and of course high profile campaigns targeting agriculture made food businesses hitting the headlines and obviously on a hot day like today uh, it feels like we might be up for another uh, year um rap sort of said there's been a bit of a penny drop moment that people are thinking about water why haven't i been focused on this and they're using the roadmap to take action. And by the time an update was published late last year, um, one uh, almost all major UK retailers, um, but only a fifth of half's businesses and a third of suppliers had signed up. So, um, you know, ISS, do you, you know, why do you think, um, you know, why do you think we're a bit behind here? Uh, what could we, what could we do to kind of drive the action on water, Philip? I, I think it's just um, working with our clients and getting them to understand it. I think their, their focuses have been on energy and some of the other areas. And I don't think they've actually appreciated the, the impact of water. So I think that's one of the things that it's just bringing that forward to them and, and then they'll start to see that change. Yeah. So yeah, it's harder for contract caterers such as yourselves. We need we need a, a high street <laughs> or a QSR on the, on, the, on the panel today to be able to talk about somebody who owns their operations. Um, so moving on to the last chapter, which is uh, about staff, so encouraging creativity, boosting inclusivity and fostering well-being, um, the need to know insights for 2024. Well, one of them, which is no surprise, is that staff shortages are presenting real challenges, both on the abilities for restaurants to run, but also importantly on the well-being of those left behind. And our research really indicates that things like salary, culture, of course, including massively sustainability within that, benefits, career progression and work-life balance are really being harnessed and used by HAFs to recruit and retain staff. And what we found is that obviously, when we asked them, 45% said paying more was a key quality, but interestingly, 63% said supporting a good life balance was a key quality as well. Um, and ISS, I know we've seen you trying to commit to a living wage across your global um, operations. So really looking at, um, how to look after your people and how to pay them uh, appropriately across the whole business is a really interesting and, and important thing to see. Um, we, uh, and what's interesting as well, but that, that salary piece, there was some a survey done by um, Maypal Group and they found that uh, work-life balance was the most important factor across, um, sorry, salary was less important than culture, career progression and work-life balance. So very much tied into what we found. Um, and we found that training was a really important way that people kind of helped people uh, show development, show the company values. Um, and you know, Hawksmoor are offering carbon industry training or signing up their teams to wrap free Guardian of Grub training. Um, you know, so what would you say, uh, Philip, about you know how your sustainability training is helping? 
Well, I, I think it's all about, sorry. I, I think it's all about the culture. Um, so what employees are looking for are companies where their values align with the corporate values and that's what we're, we're tri trying to show um, so we've made a number of moves signature moves as we're calling them around wages um, obviously around providing 100,000 recognizable qualifications for our employees globally so these are the yeah. types of things that are allow they're allowing um, employees to want to choose to work with ISS because their values and our values align and that's what I think is really important. And um, Nessa, do you find, Julia, do you find that your strong sustainability stance really impacts recruitment? And, you know, how do you communicate that to new joiners and existing employees? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we certainly find at recruitment stage um, that an increasing number will research what we're doing beforehand and make their decision, um, you know, partly on, on that. And then equally as someone on boards, it's really important to be educating them and inspiring them on what we're doing on, on sustainability. Um, and I have um, spoken to some of our new starters um, in Nestle Professional recently, and they've very much experienced that through the onboarding modules that they do when they start um, and their induction program, um, they're really able to experience an impressive sustainability education and um, put them in a, in a good position to understand the commitments and the positive impact um, and see how they can make make a difference so yeah it's it's fundamental um, both That's as an attractor really, and the retainer yeah and i know that you are very supportive um of you know this uh, you, recruitment within uh, hospitality um so there's obviously been some really focused uh, approaches looking at sort of older people or um, hiring refugees or other ways to fill that gap while also kind of addressing social issues. Um, I know that you're working really hard through the Choose Hospitality Pledge to draw more young people into hospitality. Do you want to give us a really quick overview of sort of how that's working and, and why it's important? Yeah, absolutely. So we launched um, launched it this year and it's off the back of, you know, we've worked with young people in hospitality through our top door competition for the last 35 years. And then we um, we were looking last year, how can we have a bigger impact? There's, um, we're all acutely aware of the staffing crisis. So we need to bring more young people in um, and change the perception of hospitality that there's a, you know, broad range of careers out there you can progress really quickly um, so we launched in um, in partnership with um, Springwood um, Career Scope and Choose Hospitality the Choose Hospitality Pledge so we're the three founding partners and essentially we're calling on ambassadors in our customers um, and partners to find the inspiring role models in their organization to go to the grassroots and talk within schools um, so we're providing toolkit resources um, to enable um, those um, ambassadors within the industry to talk to the school children. So we want to um, hold our, our goal is 400 um, school career sessions in the first year, um, of which a significant amount of those um, October um, this year. Um, we've got 20 um, partners um, signed up so far. So, um, so if anyone would yeah. like to understand more about it, we'd love you to get involved because it, it is this common industry challenge. Yeah, completely. And uh, just last point I want to make before we wrap up is that what also came through really strongly in the research was that creative opportunities attract chefs. And one of my favourite quotes of the whole report this year was, chefs are the new climate rock stars, which was uh, from Carolyn Ball at Compass. So, um, Rachel, could you tell us, you know, how can we ensure that chefs are galvanised and given the right tools so they can be at play a massive part of the solution? Yeah, so, I mean, we have an incredibly talented pool of chefs who also hold the keys to success really in, in achieving our, our net zero target given that so many of our emissions sit within the food we buy so following feedback from chefs around their uncertainty of, of actionable steps that they can take to support our goals we developed a circular menu creation guide so it was based on guidance from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's big food redesign report um, and gives various recommendations on different ingredients ingredient types to create a more climate friendly and circular menu um, and full implementation means a reduction in our carbon, land, biodiversity and water footprint, as well as reducing the food waste from kitchens. Now, whilst that's only guidance, we have also included a net zero module in our mandatory e-learning. So we have over 21,000 people that have now completed that basic training so far. That's amazing. Listen, I'm really sorry to everyone listening. We did overrun by a few minutes there, but you all saying such amazing things and there was so much I was excited to share with you. So I hope you will forgive me. But I want to end on that positive note of how 
you know, our chefs, our teams, they all have such power in their hands to really help us meet uh, those net zero and sort of sustainability targets. There is so much in the report. Please uh, do download it. It's going to go live at two o'clock today. So there's loads of, uh, loads more in there. Um, we want you to read it, share it. Uh, this, it will really help you. Thank you so much to our amazing panel. You've been so full of great insight and examples and really made so many of these issues real. Thank you very much, Julia, Rachel, and Philip. I am so grateful. We are all so grateful. And of course, we are grateful to our sponsors, uh, Nestle Professional. Thank you very much for enabling us to do this important work and to create it in a report to share with you the industry to help you hopefully go out there and make a difference. Thank you for all the work you're doing already. And please continue. So that's it from me. Thank you very much.